That's awesome. 3 0 on defect is great. Hey, Jaco. Hey, Rat Bout. Alright. Let's check out defect. So, I'm not going to be reading chat quite as much because I'm going to be going into egregious detail talking about the character that I'm playing. We got three pieces of information to break down before we start the run. The first one's always the same, but it's worth talking about in an overexplained video. We got to talk about the Defects starter deck. The Defects starter deck has actually only got as much defense as the Ironclad starter deck. It's got the four basic defense and 11 cards, which is exactly the same ratio and amount of defense as the Ironclad starter deck has. But Defect does not have a sustain relic. And so Defect, more than either of the other two characters, is quite susceptible to taking damage early on in runs. In your first three easy hallway fights even, you'll often have turns where Defect's just going to take like 10 damage because the enemies attack and you can't kill them yet and you didn't draw enough defense. If you fight against like two lice, you could get unlucky and have a turn like that. So because of that, one of the priorities for Defect as you go through Act 1 is picking up probably one good block card. And your dream is like Glacier, but something like Equilibrium is great also, and something like Charge Battery or Leap will do in a pinch if that's what you're offered. Getting that stuff added to this deck makes it much more capable of sustaining itself through fights. In terms of damage though, Defect has better damage than either of the other starting characters, so you do get to end fights faster than the other characters do. And that means that Defect's quite good at Act 1 Elites, because against, say, Gremlin Knob, for example, defensive cards don't really matter, it's all about dealing the right amount of damage, and you've already got a good start toward dealing that amount of damage. It also means that you have a bit more damage than the other characters, which means you don't have to invest quite so heavily into damage cards to get you through Act 1. Which means that with Defect, you can sort of ride the line of not quite having enough damage to survive Act 1, but keeping your deck thin enough that once you get into Act 2, when scaling cards become a big deal and block cards become a big deal, you don't have such a large deck that adding one card to it doesn't make a very big difference. So if I'm playing Silent, and I start with a 13 card deck, and I have to add like 3 damage commons to my deck to beat Gremlin Knob reliably, by the time that I get to Act 2, that's already 15 pretty bad cards that are in the way of me drawing my good cards, like Crippling Cloud or Footwork or Noxious Fumes or whatever. With Defect, it's much more possible to get through Act 1 without having such a large amount of crappy cards in my deck. So the Dream Defect Act 1 is like, grab an Equilibrium or a Glacier, grab a Doom and Gloom and or a Ball Lightning, and then actually start building for late game already. Because Act 1 largely asks you to block and attack, and once we get a little bit better at blocking, we don't need that much help with attacking. We're already just about done. So that's Defect's starter deck. Alright, we have to look at the map and the whale bonuses. Doesn't really matter which order we do it in. This map looks atrocious so far. So we're being forced into an elite fight very early, and then we're going to get one campfire and then another elite fight, it looks like. Our goal in any Act 1 is to spend our current HP to get our deck as strong as possible for Act 2 without dying. So at the end of the Act, we heal three quarters of our missing health. So if I could end the Act with 30 HP, and sort of a B strength deck, that would be a significantly worse than ending the act with 5 HP and an A strength deck. So I want to make sure that I'm like taking that one extra elite fight so that I can get my deck a little bit stronger so that when I go into act two and get the three quarters missing health heal, I'm set up to win the run from there. That said, you do have to not die, and this act looks terrifying absolutely terrifying. Unless we get a good block common, taking this path is not really an option because these hallway fights will kill us, even if we survive the elite. Taking the super elite without a campfire first is not really an option. And 
taking this path with two elites in a row with no campfire is also not an option. So I think the only way that we can expect to survive this act is this path, which means at least three hallway fights, two events, then we're fighting elites already with a campfire to rest and another elite fight, and then what we want to have happen from there is for us to get to go this way because this extra elite fights a lot of extra strength, but realistically we might die, so we might have to just take this path out of the act. We'll have to make a judgment call at this relic, whether we're strong enough or not. Thank you for the $3 donation. Hello and welcome to Slay the Spire. Over explain with me, Mr. Explainerman. Just okay. follow my advice and in no time at all you'll be watching the- I want to beat your thing. Thank you for the donation though. All right, so let's look at this whale bonus. In this act, the main thing that we're caring about from the whale bonus is getting strong enough to not die. So depending on what the act looks like, we could care about a lot of different things from the whale. Um, one thing about defect starter relic is that it's very strong in act one, but it becomes a little bit less strong later in the run. It does two main things for us. It gives us a lot of damage in Act 1. It's very important that we channel a Lightning Orb so that Dual Cast can evoke the Lightning Orb twice, for example. That turns Dual Cast into a card that deals 16 damage from 1 energy, which is great in early fights. But if we trade this away, all of a sudden that doesn't happen. A card like Compile Driver doesn't work anymore. Um, yeah, so Crack Core does two things, it gives us front loader damage early in a run, and it turns on our orb cards and makes them actually do stuff as we play them. And a lot of late game defect decks are about making your orb stronger and stronger as the fight goes on, so starting with the lightning orb can actually be sort of relevant because you're getting your multiplicative scaling kick-started straight away. If we were in an act where that front loader damage didn't matter so much, we could consider trading our boss relic if none of the other three whale options were great. This is an act where the front loaded damage really matters because we have to survive this fight. So we can't be doing that. Um, removing two cards is not super incredibly important on defect, but I'd rather do this than not do it. I think that max HP on defect isn't so important because several reasons. One, you've got cards like self repair, so you don't have to rest at campfires as much as uh, silent does. So not having the max HP, one of the things that max HP does is make a campfire rest heal you for more, but you don't have to worry so much about that. Defect's very good at using apparitions out of Act 2, and that's something that Ironclad doesn't get to do. Ironclad is usually quite poor at using apparitions, but Defect has Echo Form and Seek and a decent amount of card manipulation, and so Defect can often take apparitions in Act 2, and if you have apparitions out of Act 2, you don't care quite as much about max HP because you're going to be intangible against the heart on the dangerous attacks a decent amount of the time. And Defect also has genetic algorithm, so Defect has an Uncommon which can get picked up in Act 1, 2, or even the early parts of Act 3, which give it gives it a huge amount of block for the dangerous turns in Act 4. So Defect doesn't need max HP quite as much as Ironclad does. I'd say that Silent often needs 70 max HP if Silent doesn't have the right stuff to set up, but sometimes Silent can get away with not much max HP. Ironclad usually really needs quite a bit of max HP in a, in a normal run, but Defect doesn't. So we could take this, I'd rather take it than not take it, but obtaining three random potions or choosing a card, um, both of these are going to help us out significantly more with fighting the elites. I think because I'm guaranteed three hallway fights coming up, and then I'm going to have to fight an elite, if I take the potion I'm putting myself in a... If I take the potions, I'm putting myself in a situation where I probably want to use the potions in the hallway fights. They're going to keep me a little bit healthier, and then I'm going to die to the elite, something like that. If I choose the card, I start getting benefits from that card straight away. I get through the hallway fights healthier. The way the potion chance works, there's a 40% chance in this fight. If I miss, there's a 50% chance there and a 60% chance here. So I should get at least one potion by the time I'm fighting an elite fight. And hopefully I won't get a hallway fight from either of these events, because if I do, all of a sudden I'm fighting a hard hallway fight before the elite fight, and that's going to be terrifying. Um, the first three hallway fights of each act are easy fights, and then after that you start drawing enemies from a hard pool. But hopefully we'll be all right. So we're looking at a card. Our options are Tempest, Beam, Cell, Storm. These options are not good. I might just skip the whale bonus here. So 
So the problem with Beam Cell is Defect's early game damage is quite good. It's also based largely on orbs. And so we're looking to supplement it because it's not good enough yet. If um if good is seven out of ten right now, we're probably at a four or five out of ten right now. And we could benefit from going beyond good and having great early game damage too. That would help us in the elite fights that we're taking later. So getting some more damage into the deck is great. But Beam Cell is just not very good at doing that. Something I don't think I mentioned is um, Defect doesn't have a 2-cost card like Ironclad does. And Defect also doesn't have a very good upgrade like both Ironclad and Silent do. Zap is usually your starting upgrade, but it only makes Zap cost 0 and you're already playing a deck that doesn't have much to do with its energy, really. Like, Zap costing 0 right now is going to let us play another defend on the turn that we play Zap, so... If we're not getting attacked, that actually literally does nothing, and the rest of the time it's 5 block. That's not so incredible. Um, so adding another 0 cost card to the deck is just pretty awkward, especially when this doesn't combo with anything except for our strikes. Storm doesn't do anything right now. Tempest is just quite bad. Um, if we get some sort of energy stuff going on, some sort of synergy with lightning orb, something like that. Tempest could be a good card. If we recycle it, we get back however much energy that we have right now, so that can double our energy in a pinch if we have recycle later in the game, but right now we don't have any of that stuff, so Tempest is just sort of bad right now. And Storm obviously doesn't do anything. The thing about powers which sort of multiply in strength together is that it's really hard to take the first one because it doesn't do anything yet. So I think this is just a skip. All right, so we're in terrible shape. <laughs> we're in absolutely atrocious shape, and we're playing the turn against the two lice where we take 10 damage. So there you go. Otherwise, the fight went fine. And we got a focus potion, which is awesome. That's going to make any cards that channel orbs a higher priority right now. Something to be aware of is that the potions you have change the value of the cards that you're picking right now. So I have to get through this elite fight and I have to, you know, not die in that elite fight and I'm going to be using all of the resources made available to me in the next few floors and that I currently have to do that. That means that if I just picked up a steroid potion, all of a sudden Rip and Tear is a better card because Rip and Tear is going to get twice as much benefit from the steroid potion. If I pick up a solution, if I pick up a focus potion, all of my lightning orb sort of stuff becomes way better. All of my frost storm stuff becomes way, way better too. And so looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and grab a static discharge, which was already the pick, but becomes even more so the pick because of the focus potion, making the orbs more beneficial. Okay. <laughs> so out of these three cards, Go for the Eyes is a very interesting defect card, in my opinion. Zero cost cards in this game sometimes become terrible at the end of Act 1, because at the end of Act 1 you may take Snekawai or you might take Choker, and both of those things make zero cost cards significantly worse. So taking zero cost cards in Act 1 is... A little bit disencouraged because of that. Often zero cost cards get put in your deck in Act 2 instead of Act 1 because you've already seen the boss relic and know that you're not going to be screwing them over. Zero cost cards get a lot better as you get more card draw or as you struggle with energy. The two main resources in the game are card draw and energy and you want to sort of line them up so that you're playing about so that for every like five cards you draw, you actually get decent output. So if you only have three energy, you need in your five cards that you're drawing, maybe one or two zero cost cards so that you can actually play cards. If you have four or five energy, but only draw five cards per turn, you really don't want zero cost cards in your deck at all, because you want to be able to turn your energy into something useful, and the zero cost card just doesn't really let you do that. So Go For The Eyes is a card that is sometimes good in defect, and is sometimes really not good and you have to just judge that based on what's going on with your resources. 
Another thing about Go for the Eyes is that in Act 4, the Act 4 Elites have two artifact charges, the Heart gets two artifact charges on turn 4, and Defect doesn't have a ton of ways to deal with artifact charges. So Go for the Eyes becomes somewhat binary in Act 4, where either you commit to enough copies of cards like Go for the Eyes, and Beam Cell, and maybe a Poison Potion, stuff like that, so that you can get through the artifact charges. If you have a Bag of Marbles or a Red Mask, that helps a lot to get through the artifact charges in the Elite Fight. Or, the card's just atrocious. <laughs> One of those two things is going to happen. And so... There's a lot of stuff to think about with Go for the Eyes and whether or not to pick it up at all points in the run. And sometimes, even though this is like a mediocre looking common, sometimes Go for the Eyes is a better pick in Act 3 than it is in Act 1 because you happen to have enough card draw, you already have one or two other Go for the Eyes, and you're like, huh, I'm getting to a point where I can actually remove the artifact charges in Act 4. Recycle is another card that's either great or terrible. Recycles, <laughs> or anywhere in between. Recycle gets much stronger as you get more card drawn to your deck, so if your deck has some compile drivers which are drawing two or three cards each, Recycle can be quite good. The ability to exhaust towards certain cards for a boss fight is very powerful in this game, so getting rid of all of your strikes and some of your defense or something like that as you go through a fight leaves you with only strong cards left is the idea, and Defect has a few infinite things it can do, especially with the card Fusion, which... Fusion Plus costs one energy to make an orb which evokes for two energy. So that can end up putting you in a loop where you're generating energy or at least not losing energy as you generate block or damage. So Recycle can especially be good for Act 2 boss fights because Act 2 boss fights, the enemies do not put statuses in your deck, which makes them more more able to be attacked by infinite combos than just about any other fight in the game. They're long fights where enemies don't put statuses in your deck, so trying to exhaust toward an infinite combo can be really good in Act 2. Right now, Recycle's trash, so we're not taking Recycle right now, but it's a card you want to be thinking about when you see it. Static Discharge is awesome. I think that sometimes it takes a while to evaluate how strong a card is when the card requires you to take damage. It's sort of interesting to see the ways that people judge those things, like Offering I think most people think is really great, but a lot of people think Hemokinesis is bad, and Combust is bad, and it's unclear why. Like, as a new player to the game, maybe it's just really difficult to judge how big a deal it is to lose life. At Ascension 20, trying to kill the heart, you're going to lose health in fights, and elite fights, and events, and boss fights. So that's an expectation rather than something that you're afraid of. And something to work out is how to lose health and get value out of it. So for example, if you're going through Act 2 and you have max HP, you want to fight elite fights, and you don't want to try to spend all of your energy every turn on blocking because you have to actually kill the elite fights in Act 2 before they outscale you and kill you. And so you want to make sure that you have damage cards in your deck. And playing a Doom and Gloom on turn 2 of an Act 2 Elite fight probably means that you're not full blocking on that fight, but it's okay. You're going to have to take some damage in order to deal damage to enemies. And regularly in this game, you're trading some of your health to be able to end a fight. Static Discharge makes you way, way, way better at that. So now every time that you take damage, you're channeling, or take attack damage rather, you're channeling one lightning orb, and that's going to deal a bunch of damage for you as the fight goes on. Defect has a lot of multiplicative scaling with orbs, so as you get more focus, that deals even more damage. As you get capacitors, you're able to channel more of them at once and deal all the passive damage with them. If you get electrodynamics, they hit every enemy at once. Another thing that's very, very strong about Static Discharge, which isn't immediately obvious, is that it can evoke orbs during the enemy's turn which means that if you have a Frost Orb channeled and you're full on orbs and you get hit, that Frost Orb's going to evoke. So if something's attacking me for 5 and the next thing's attacking me for 7, I can block for 4, it will attack me for 5, it will channel a Lightning Orb for me, evoke my Frost Orb, now I have 5 block, and the next thing attacks me for 7 but only actually does 2. And so Static Discharge is a block card. Um, this is probably on the Chaotic Neutral, perhaps, of block card alignment, but Static Discharge is definitely a block card. And it's a very relevant block card for the times 15 attacks by the heart, which is 
like the turn of the game where you have to block for the most in the entire game. So the fact that it's a block card there is a really big deal for um, making you win runs. All right, cool. So took a static discharge. Quite happy to have one of those. Oof. Oof. Oh no. Act one is very heavily about trading your health for deck strength. And a lot of the events in Act 1 actually uh, match up with that thematically. This is an event where we can trade 21 health to upgrade two random cards. There is a point where you have to recognize that you don't have enough health to do this anymore. And I think we're, we're probably in that point. I don't really think that we can trade 21 health go to 33 right now i think against gremlin knob we always take at least 32 damage pretty much and sometimes take more like 50 damage which is unfortunate because that's how much health we have so against gremlin knob we probably die quite a lot right now against sentries if we were to get a frost orb from the next three floors we probably only take something like 15 to 20 damage Against Lagavulin, if we were to get a Frost Orb the next few floors, we'd probably only take something like 10 to 15 damage. If we can take this and survive this fight, I would like to take it. Because two random upgrades for Defect right now are more valuable than um, one regular upgrade, so... Getting the two random upgrades is going to be better than getting an upgrade instead of a rest at a later campfire. Defect has quite a lot of um, commons which create frost orbs with the focus potion. Defect has a good number of decent block commons. I think that I meant to take this. There's no hard and fast rule with this. It's just the overarching decision making in Act 1 is how do I spend my health to make my deck as strong as possible without dying. And I think that we die sometimes by taking this, but overall on average we get stronger than we do by not taking it. Even counting the times where we die, where you're not usually very strong when you're dead, but yeah. Alright, double strike plus. Strike plus is not a bad card at all early in the game. Early in the game, you sort of are trying to add strike pluses to your deck without making your deck as terrible as possible. Like, Ball Lightning is like a strike plus plus plus. Compile Driver is a strike plus plus. Um, you're generally very happy to have cards which basically do the same thing as strike but better in your deck, and that's essentially what strike plus is. So upgrading a strike is almost comparable to removing a card and adding a new mediocre card to your deck. Because um, the new mediocre cards that you're adding to your deck right now basically are strike pluses. That's basically what you're looking for. So that's fine. We're still very low on defensive cards, though. That's something that we're not currently good at. I think that if we do not hit the front slime with dual cast here, we probably just straight up lose the run immediately. Okay. So we only take seven that turn. That's great. I wouldn't have minded defend upgrades, given the situation that we find ourselves in health-wise. But hey, here we are. All right, cool. So a second Static Discharge is really not necessary at any stage in the game, I don't think. Um, a problem with having too many stacks of Static Discharge is that it will evoke all of your Frost Orbs at once in the Heart Fight. And then you don't have any Frost Orbs anymore. And unless you have very, very good Frost Orb generation in your deck, you will just die like a turn or two later. So building for late game, we actually sort of don't want to have more than one or two stacks of Static Discharge in our deck. Compile Driver is fine. A little bit of damage. Sweeping Beam is fine. 
little bit of AoE damage. The effect doesn't have any AoE damage at the start of a run, and your only great AoE options are Doom and Gloom, which is an uncommon, and Electro Dynamics, which is rare. So pretty often you just have to make do with the Sweeping Beam or two in order to get yourself through Act 2 Elite Fights, where um, AoE damage starts to become very, very relevant. If I was fighting against Slime Boss right now, it's definitely a Sweeping Beam. If I was fighting against... Hmm. I think probably the fact that we're fighting against Hexaghost makes it a compile driver. This is a situation where you can sort of think about what fights are coming up and what you struggle with and stuff like that. Compile driver is better against Gremlin Knob significantly too. Sentries are one of the easier elite fights, and that's where Sweeping Beam is good. So I think this comes down to being a compile driver. Overall, we're like probably at a 6 out of 10 for dealing damage right now. And I said I want it to be at a 7 out of 10, so... Not the best, but we're doing okay. In this spot, it looks sort of appealing to take one damage, but usually you're not meant to. Usually just playing two defends gets you through the fight okay. We'll see. Maybe I shouldn't have played Static Discharge then. Hmm. So I've talked about Beam Cell already. Beam Cell's gotten significantly better with the addition of Compile Driver and two copies of Strike Plus. It is a better card than it was the first time that we saw it. I don't think it's making the cut yet, but it's a much better card than it was the first time we saw it. In fact, the fact that like Compile Driver draws cards and Zap hasn't been upgraded yet makes a zero-cost card that deals damage pretty appealing. I would take it over skipping right now. The question here is largely whether or not we can take the genetic algorithm. Genetic Algorithm's one of the keystone cards for winning defect runs. It just, it's sort of like picking up feed early in Act 1 with Ironclad. It gives you so much more room to work with later on in the game because you have this um, immense uh, pool of defensive resources to pivot around. And if we don't take Genetic Algorithm, I do think that Compile Driver is going to be better than Beam Cell still. Double Compile Driver with only Lightning Orbs. It's also a Hexaghost act. Against Hexaghost, we have to deal 240 damage or whatever before turn 8, and having a big genetic algorithm doesn't really help in any way. So I think we do not get to take genetic algorithm here, unfortunately. And I think we just have to take the Compile Driver. Deck's a little bit better at dealing damage than it used to be. Okay. Okay. I have two compile drivers. So, Warped Tongues is a very, very, very strong special relic. What Warped Tongues does is at the start of every turn, we upgrade a random card in our hand that is not yet upgraded, or that can be upgraded, rather. So you can actually upgrade Searing Blow over and over again with it, in theory, if you're Ironclad and have Searing Blow. Or if you're a different class and have Searing Blow, I guess. The problem, of course, being that Pain is not a very good curse to have when you're at 26 HP and about to fight Elites. Against Lagavulin and Sentries, I think it's definitely correct to take the curse. And against Gremlin Knob, I think we might just be dead. So I think we just take the curse. This is something where you just have to spend a lot of time playing with pain to get an idea of how bad it actually is to have it. Sentries should be okay. 
with any luck, we'll be alright here. Taking 15, no big deal. Sort of a big deal. <laughs> it's not the best turn. So I believe it ends up being correct. Hmm. I definitely want to defend in my... We're about to reshuffle the discard pile into a draw pile. So which cards we have in hand matters a lot because they don't go into our new draw pile. And I definitely want to have a defend in my new draw pile, given that I'm going to be at three very soon. The question then is, do I like compile driver this to put it at a 19? to try to kill it and the back sentry next turn. And the dazes that way don't matter because we don't have um, we don't have our discard pile about to be shuffled into our draw pile. If I play strike right now, I get six dazes, unless I kill this one, in which case I get three dazes. And then all of that goes into a new draw pile with the compile drivers and the strike. Or I can compile driver right now, and that way the dazes are going into a discard pile and I never see them. I think that's better, and I think I will go for this, too. And drawing the pain is so good, because now I have 18 cards without a pain. Okay, we missed the back sentry, unfortunately. We have to kill both the front sentry and the back sentry this turn. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. We win the fight! Go okay. You got some gold. Always important to remember that you get gold from elite fights because that's actually a significant chunk of the reward you get. Like 5 to 10% of the reward from elite fights is the gold. So when you're evaluating what you're getting out of this floor, keep that in mind. Calipers is a relic that's actually really good with the genetic algorithm that we just didn't take. Although... I think I'm okay with not having taken the genetic algorithm. Calipers is a relic which can be very strong on defect if you build a deck that abuses it, but unfortunately the ways that you can abuse calipers on defect are either you get genetic algorithm early in the run, in which case like good for you, that's something that you wanted to happen anyway, and it gets way better with calipers, but it's not like you didn't already want that to happen. Or you get a ton of focus and a ton of frost orbs, in which case, again, good for you. Um, that's what you wanted to happen anyway. So Calipers is a very strong relic on defect, but it's a very strong relic in decks that we're already going to win probably anyway. And it makes those decks more capable of winning, but it's not a, not a relic that really helps us get to the point where we have a deck that's going to win. It's a relic that if we get lucky and go in that direction, it will help us win even more. It's not a relic that currently helps us, is maybe one way of phrasing what I'm trying to say. Because we're currently playing a deck that is not looking like it's going to win. And Calipers is just not the relic that this deck needed. We needed like a Mercury Hourglass or a Symbiotic Virus or a Data Disc or something like that. So we now have a 50% chance of the next Elite fight being Gremlin Knob. If we're fighting against Lagavulin, we're probably okay, maybe. Against Lagavulin, the thing we have to do is survive two attacks, and then we will be able to kill Lagavulin before the third attack hits us, almost certainly with Static Discharge and our Lightning Orbs and all of our Strike Pluses and Compile Drivers and stuff. Against Lagavulin, I would say that Go for the Eyes is probably the best card here, because I think that surviving the first two attacks is more difficult for us against Lagavulin than it is to kill Lagavulin before the third attack hits. Unless I'm sort of... Unless I'm largely misevaluating how much damage we have, but I don't think I am. I think Go for the Eyes is what we want against Lagavulin. Against Gremlin Knob, I'm pretty sure that we want Go for the Eyes too. Against Gremlin Knob, the tricky thing here is working out how to survive the attack on turn 3, 
when we're going to be vulnerable and hit for 24 after taking 8 the previous turn. And one sensible answer is use Go for the Eyes to weaken Gremlin Mob that turn. So we do get to rest in between now and then, so we'll have a bit more health. And then if we draw Go for the Eyes on the right turn against Gremlin Knob, all of a sudden we're doing okay. We've got two compile drivers to try to do that. That's awesome. I don't think that Bullseye is terrible here, but I think that we already have a bunch of strike pluses in our deck. One, two, three, four, basically. And adding another card that's effectively strike plus to our deck is probably not doing all that much for us right now. I guess there are two two halves of this. One is like both of these cards help us kill both Lagavulin and Gremlin Knob. Although I think Go for the Eyes is significantly better against Lagavulin. Bullseye might be a bit better against Gremlin Knob actually. But another half of it is that with Bullseye we now have five copies of Strike Plus in our deck. And that's just too many copies of Strike Plus. We just don't really need that many copies of Strike Plus. Just starts to get in the way, whereas Go for the Eyes starts rounding out our ability to block and, and things like that. White Noise, um, White Noise becomes a good card if you have a lot of power synergies, but we currently don't. That's the main reason that White Noise would be good. I could try to upgrade Static Discharge before I played it. Seems sort of insane. Seems sort of insane. Against Lagavulin, we, one, have a decent chance of surviving because we're not fighting Gremlin Knob, so that's nice. Two, we get three turns to set up before it's actually time to fight. And with Warped Tongues, we have good incentive to wait until turn three before we start dealing damage. If I strike plus right now, the fight starts straight away, but we miss out on two upgrades with Warped Tongues. I would probably survive, but I think it's better to pass twice, or at least once. Okay, Go For The Eyes upgrade is great. Not drawing Go For The Eyes um, two turns from now is awkward, although we will reshuffle the draw pile, so maybe we just will draw it again. That's good. I'm not going to play cards with pain in my hand. This is a very interesting turn. So, I can choose whether or not to reshuffle here. We're definitely playing this Compile Driver. If I reshuffle with the other Compile Driver right now, I can reshuffle a draw pile that doesn't have all of these strikes in it. It does have Pain in it, but it also has Go for the Eyes Plus, and it has three Defends. I could play Defend and then Compile Driver. I don't think the damage lines up properly for that. So this is just a judgment call on exactly what the draw pile should look like and how much output we're willing to sacrifice to make it look that way. I'm going to go Strike Plus Compile Driver, so I'm putting a Strike Plus in my deck but not these basic cards, and I'm going to assume that that's probably alright. Right now, if I just play this Defend next turn, I'm fine. If I play Compile Driver and draw Defend, I'm also fine, because I can play that Defend this turn. All right. I think I have to play Defend over Strike Plus to guarantee that I don't die next turn, though. It was good that we drew, drew uh, Go for the Eyes there. Very good that we drew Go for the Eyes there. Okay, so Pain is in our draw pile, so we don't want to Compile Driver before playing other cards in this case. Often you want to be playing your draw cards first, but not here. I'll wait on playing the Strike Plus in case I draw another Defend off the Compile Driver. Nope, it's fine. No reason to play any cards here. And like I said, our deck beats Lagavulin pretty comfortably before Lagavulin attacks again. Alright, so another 30 gold. We got a Ginger, which means we can no longer become weakened. Um, not being able to become weakened isn't the most exciting thing on Defect, because a lot of our damage is from orbs, which don't have their damage reduced by weakened. 
one thing to think about is that Collector gives you three debuffs at the end of Act 2, and Weakened is the first debuff that's applied. So having Ginger means that an artifact pot can stop you from getting one of the defensive debuffs applied to you. Mostly, though, this is not, not incredibly relevant, but will be surprisingly useful over the next like act and a half probably in hallway fights and stuff like that because we just have a bunch of strike pluses so even though we're trying to deal damage with orbs realistically we're regularly spending an energy to try to deal nine damage to something and our options are cool headed go for the eyes and steam barrier so steam barrier is the closest card we've seen to that block card that i alluded to us wanting at the start of the act when i said that we wanted a block common steam barrier is okay here um we do have two compile drivers so the value of zero cost cards goes up we haven't been to the end of act one yet and made sure that we're not taking a velvet choker or a snack away from it though so Trying to avoid those zero cost cards for a while longer would be sort of nice. The rest of the act is um, mainly about surviving these two hallway fights. We get to go to the store, remove pain, buy another potion, and try to get through these two fights. And then we rest, and then with static discharge, we should be fine against Hexaghost, I hope. Um, yeah, but Steam Barrier and Go for the Eyes are both probably not the best cards here, and Cool Headed is arguably the best defect common, so we're probably just going to take Cool Headed. Being able to channel Frost Orbs is a very, very big deal. Maybe 80 to 90% of defects winning runs that I play, most of my block comes from Frost Orbs. So getting those going now with the assumption that that's what's going to happen this time too makes a lot of sense. This is one of the few runs where it's pretty reasonable with calipers early that we end up with genetic algorithms and we actually don't need frost orbs quite as much, but right now there's no reason to think that. Cool Headed is an excellent late game card. At the start of the game, you only are asked to attack and block and you have a fairly small deck, so you know, all of your cards do one of those two things, basically, and there isn't that much trouble drawing a hand that can do the stuff you're being asked to do. Later on in the game, though, you're being asked to attack, block, attack for AoE damage, block AoE damage, debuff enemies, scale your deck with, like, more powers and focus and things like that. You're being asked to do a lot more stuff to win fights. And so drawing more cards later on in the game becomes a much bigger deal because your deck is full of cards which do different things. And on each turn, you may need to do one of those things or two of those things, but you might draw cards which do three other things, which aren't the things that you were looking to do. And so being able to draw cards becomes much, much more important as runs go on, typically. Being able to match the right card to the right situation is dependent on being able to draw that card on the turn where you want to play it. So Cool Headed's a card that is very, very good later on in the game. It's okay now. Um, it's nice with Static Discharge. Yeah. We got ourselves a Kettle Ball. We can now gain strength at rest sites by lifting up to three times. So this is not a very useful relic at the moment. I'm definitely resting at this campsite. I might be able to lift here, I guess. But in terms of surviving these two hallway fights, it doesn't do anything, obviously. Typically speaking, if I want to kill the heart, obviously I have to take a sapphire key out of a chest at some point in the run. But typically speaking, even a poor relic, if the poor relic gets to give you output for Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, and Act 4, is going to add up to doing more than a pretty decent relic that only gets to give you output for the latter half of Act 3 and Act 4. So it's pretty uncommon to want to be skipping one of the relics early, just because if you look at the sum of their output over the course of a run, they end up doing enough even though they're not the best relics because you have them for longer. Sapphire Key obviously doesn't do anything. 
thing until we use it to unlock a door at the end of Act 3. So taking it now doesn't make it any better than it would be if we took it in Act 3. Whereas taking Kettleball now makes it a much better relic than it would have been if we took it in Act 3 because we have the next two acts to get value out of it. And I think we probably can lift at some point. Getting plus one strength is fine on defect. Um, Barrage is a card on defect which fairly commonly becomes a major damage source so plus strength actually can do something uh, multiplicatively. Defect has lots and lots and lots and lots of ways to get enough damage to win the run, and enough block to win the run, and enough scaling to win the run. So being open to the idea that you might do something unusual that you don't usually do on Defect is a pretty big deal, I think. Because I think that actually happens quite often. Oh, stores are, stores are the hardest part of the game. We could sit here for a very long time. <laughs> What's Twitch chat doing? Let's see. Oh gosh, I haven't talked to Twitch chat for a while. It's been 40 minutes. Oh no. Uh, Mr. Beastiemon, thank you very much for the $3 shit post. Appreciate that. MT, thanks for the five months with Twitch Prime. Miomia, thanks for the five months. Rhodes Dakaro, thanks for the three months. Jiga, thanks for the three months. Napo, thanks for the seven months. Frederick, thanks for the four months. Dazku, thanks for the prime. Who's with Uzi, thanks for the 18 months. Narox, thanks for the nine months. Tijol, thanks for the 17 months. Zero Gray, thanks for the prime. Inex, thanks for the prime. Princess Pretty, thanks for the three months. Cavalier, thanks for the four months. And Dione, thanks for the eight months. Hope you're doing well. You're banging. Great. Oh, there's a prismatic orb in the store. I'm sorry that I'm not able to afford that. Okay, so returning to... Oh, talking a lot. Um, The big thing here is that we have two... And these are hard pool hallway fights, so this can be like Gremlin Gang or Slime Gang, or it can be two pretty tough enemies at the same time. We have to survive these to play the rest of the run. So probably we just want to buy the thing that helps us survive those to play the rest of the run. Removing pain is, I think, I think it's probably obvious to most people watching why that's really important and we can just go ahead and do it. I guess, okay. Um, card draw is one of the most vital resources in the game. And so curses are really bad because of that, because you have to draw them and they don't do anything. I guess that point's worth making. Because some people might be thinking, oh, pain's bad because it deals us two damage when we draw it or something like that. And yeah, that is one of the reasons it's bad, but also the fact that it isn't a better card that can actually do something is very, very, very significant. And so very often when you go to a store, you want to remove a strike so that you can draw better cards. Um, and if you have curses in your deck very commonly, you want to just get rid of that curse so that you can draw better cards instead. And you typically don't want curses in your deck. So now we have to work out how exactly we are beating two difficult hallway fights in a row. I think one of the potions is called for. We only have four defends, so a deck spot's not really that great. So I think I'm going to splurge on an Essence of Steel. Potions are pretty nice because you don't have to draw them or play them. You just like click on them and then they go into play. So they let you cheat the rules of the game a little bit for one fight. And then the only card that we have enough gold left for is FTL at this point. And FTL is pretty good with plus strength, which we may be ending up having. Um, I think it's okay to take FTL here. It's pretty bad with Choker, pretty bad with Sneko Eye. Right now, our deck is actually getting close to not wanting Sneko Eye, which is pretty unusual. Maybe that will change by the end of the act. But I think right now, because we need strength to survive these two hallway fights, we should be taking the FTL. It's just an above average card. 
Okay. This fight's not too bad. I think even though Cool Headed upgraded, the play here is Static Discharge Defend Zap and don't play the Cool Headed. That gets a bunch of damage into play and we can hopefully kill this one next turn before it kills us. These enemies I think are something like two-thirds of the time they attack and one-third of the time they buff, but they can't buff twice in a row and can't attack more than two times in a row. I think there's something like that, so it's somewhat likely that this enemy buffs itself next turn. In which case, if we poison pot the back enemy now, we should have enough damage to kill that next turn, and then this one's buffing and we don't die. And not dying seems nice. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Hmm. We did end up getting attacked again. Let's see. This one has to die. And then we can weaken this. We should be able to draw a defend, maybe. We might have to <laughs> might have to essence of steel as well, after me saying that this was an easy fight. Okay, this one has to die, right? Yeah, I believe so. So it is dead. When it dies, we become vulnerable. Unfortunate. I think we actually have draws that let us just end the fight this turn. Okay, that's fine. Now we can go go for the eyes, defend, and we're only actually taking one more damage. So we're at six, we got one more fight to get through. Tempest Darkness Leap. Leap is the block card that I was talking about. I think with two compile drivers in the deck already though, sort of have to take darkness. Two compile drivers and two zero cost cards, so getting compile drivers that draw three seems like a really big deal. Darkness is very good damage against Hexagos too, it's just generally a pretty good damage card. Leap is more likely to let us survive the next fight than Darkness is. It's just Darkness is probably the slightly better card. Hmm. This is interesting. If I had more health right now, I would definitely be taking Darkness, but maybe I'm in such a dire situation that I have to go for the slightly weaker deck, which is slightly more able to get through fights without taking damage. Tempest is not really a consideration right now, just not a very good card. Not a very good card usually. With three energy and no focus and nothing really synergizing with lightning orbs, it's especially not a very good card at the moment. I do have to beat Hexaghost still. I don't have focus. I don't have many block cards. I think I'm actually going to take the leap here. It's just a card that the deck needs. We need to be able to block better on a lot of turns, and leap can do that for us, maybe. Okay, so we got 13 damage incoming. Not going to die this turn. That's always fun. Not exactly what I wanted that to do, but that's okay. Our compile drivers are really bad at the moment if we draw them both next turn. Have to decide whether this is an essence of steel or not. We go to three. Lice are fairly unlikely to attack us again next turn. If they do attack us next turn, 13 damage is quite blockable. I think I do not use the essence of steel. We try to use that for Hexaghost.
just turns like whatever. Yeah, whatever. I think the fight ended when we didn't get attacked by two of them at the same time on that previous turn. Okay. Equilibrium genetic algorithm and turbo. Equilibrium's a very good block card. Retaining your hand for a turn is a very powerful effect. One of the most difficult things to do in this game is to take your strong cards and line them up with the turns where they're strongest, and this is one way to help you do that. So that's really sweet. Genetic Algorithm, though, is a card which is already one of the most important cards in Defect, and with Calipers, it becomes actually insane. Also with Warped Tongs, because Warped Tongs means that even without upgrading it, we're going to have quite a few fights probably where it upgrades automatically and stacks itself faster. If we can get a Genetic Algorithm up to like 60 at the end of the game with Calipers, that's like having two turns of invincibility almost. It's it's very, very, very strong. Turbo is a card that you often want one of later on in a run. The larger that your deck gets, the better turbo gets, because you don't want to like play turbo and then draw it again that turn, because you'll draw the void that you put in your discard pile. What you want to do is you want to play turbo and then hologram it back, and then like spend another three turns going through your draw pile and hologramming it back over and over again. You want to be able to seek for it on turn one to set up your echo form early, stuff like that. So turbo is a great card to have access to, but not a card that we need right now. I think I will just go ahead and take the genetic algorithm. I'm going to trust that the deck is strong enough to survive with that. Sort of have to rest here. I would love to go for a Hexaghost fight with uh, 3 HP, but this could be a hallway fight, and I actually think that's scarier than the Hexaghost fight a little bit. Well, yeah, there you go. All right, cool. All right, cool. What is this game called again? I'm never going to play this game again. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So... We got a pretty rough Gremlin Gang. It's not the worst Gremlin Gang ever. It doesn't have a Fat Gremlin. With Fat Gremlin, this would be way worse. But what we're able to do against this Gremlin Gang is just kill the Sneaky Gremlin and then kill the Gremlin Wizard. And we should be able to block for close to 10 every turn for the Mad Gremlins and kill the Gremlin Wizard before it attacks. So this fight actually should be completely fine, I think. I sort of wish that I lifted, despite the fact that the fight looks ugly. It could take 5 damage to channel lightning orb, I don't believe there's any good reason to. This turn I'm going to take 2 damage to channel 2 lightning orbs, definitely. Next turn I'm going to draw 1 block genetic algorithm and die. It's going to be great. Oh, no, we're okay. We're okay. Just barely got there. So the most block is playing a defend. Yep. I don't think it's worth it to give up four health right now to stack that genetic algorithm, especially given that there's a decent chance I just draw it again. So deliberately not ending the fight to try to draw a genetic algorithm next turn. And we get to play it. Cool. I think I took seven. It's not so bad. Is my deck good? I think with a glacier, my deck might be good. It's bad at scaling, it's bad at dealing damage, but it's good at blocking all of a sudden. Having a deck that's good at blocking as you go into Act 2 is not what you want, because you have health. So you always can be good at blocking for a fight or two, because you can just rest and have a lot of health, and uh, uh, standing there getting hit in the face is pretty effective blocking. 
you want to have a deck that's good at dealing damage going into Act 2, because then you can turn that ability into relics and into taking aggressive paths through the Act and stuff. So having a deck that's good at blocking going to Act 2 is actually sort of awkward. We should be able to deal pretty well with Holy Fights. With a Glacier, we're much more able than before to stall Holy Fights so the genetic algorithm can upgrade before we play it, which is a big deal for late in the game. It should be fine. Glacier is just a very, very, very premium defect card. The only reason I wouldn't take Glacier would be if I thought that I already was so good at blocking and was already getting so many Frost Orbs that I thought it was just sort of in the way. So if these two compile drivers were cool headeds and I had a defrag, I might legitimately think this deck already blocks for enough. Glacier is just a card that gets in the way of our ability to deal damage and maybe I wouldn't take it. We're not in a situation where our deck's good enough at blocking to not be taking Glacier though. The other cards are like Equilibrium's great, I already talked about that. I would have taken it over skipping by a long way um, both of the times that it's been offered, but the other card was better. And Multicast, if I had a Darkness, which I was thinking about, Multicast maybe becomes good, but with only Frost and Lightning and no Focus, this is not a very good card right now. Multicast is one of those cards which can become very good in a run, but you just have to sort of pay attention to what's going on and make a judgment call when you see it. It's a rare card, so you can't really like build toward it, expecting it to be good. You just have to be in the situation where it's good and see it, and then sometimes it will show up in a run for you. Often there are decks which use Recursion with Dark Orbs, and Multicast can be good in those, but you were probably already doing something with Recursion and Dark Orbs since those are much more common to see. Taking one strength, I think, is by far the best option for Exeghost. Our problem with Hexaghost isn't dying because we have 17 HP, it's dying because on turn 8 there are going to be 7 burn pluses in our deck. And burn plus is a pretty bad card. So accelerating our damage is what we want to be doing, and getting 1 strength is probably the best way to do that. Upgrading Static Discharge might have been better, arguably. Alright, cool. This fight's heavily about just playing our damage cards when we draw them. I think what I'm going to do here is... I think I'm not going to play Elite or use this Essence of Steel to channel some Lightning. So play the Static Discharge. We're getting attacked for 12. The way that the Hexaghost fight works is that this first attack is based on your current HP, so we're not getting attacked for much because we start the fight with low HP. Then um, these turns we get attacked for 6 or 12. This turn we get attacked this turn. This turn we get attacked for 18. This turn we get attacked for 9. So having enough to survive, especially the 18 attack, is a pretty big deal. Just wondering if I need to make sure I have slightly more block than this. I think I'm going to die to Hex, I guess. Man. Right now I'd have five blocks starting. I would take one, then I'd take three, then I'd take five, and I'd evoke the Frost Orb and stop taking damage. So I'm taking five damage to evoke three Lightning Orbs. I'm also getting Genetic Algorithm out of the deck so I don't have to draw it again, which is sort of a relevant thing. And I'm not using the Plated Armor because... yeah, I think that's fine. Not using the Plated Armor because it would be removed. But the plan is to use Plated Armor, like, now, though. I'm not playing Glacier. I don't think. Is dual cast better than compile driver? This is going to evoke this turn. So that deals an extra five, basically. No. So just go ahead and take two damage with the Essence of Steel and keep damaging Hexagos, trying to win this fight.
Okay. Sort of have to full block that turn. Another one this turn. It's getting scary. This is the first very difficult turn of the fight. This turn is very difficult. I think I am always playing Compile Driver, so let's start with that. Next turn we're getting attacked for 9, and then the turn after that we're getting attacked for 36 and we'll die. So we want to kill the Hexagos before we get attacked for 36. If I don't play any block cards here at all, I end up taking 4 the first time, then 1 the second time. I go to 4, but I channel 2 Lightning Orbs. Killing two lightning orbs. Deals eight damage. Plus six, plus nine the next turn is 23. 30. Plus another nine. 39. 49. 56. 67. I think it's actually slightly more damage than is needed. The problem would just be drawing the attack cards at a pace that I could actually play them while blocking for 9 next turn. My Calipers? 22. I can't quite get any Calipers stuff going. I think it might be Strike Pass. And then the danger is just if I die next turn, but I do have a speed potion and a guarantee of drawing at least one block card, so I shouldn't die next turn. And then I always win the fight. If I block, I have 6 damage, then 6 damage again, then 6 damage again, 28, 35... 42, 53, 60. So if I block, there's a pretty real chance that I die to the overcharge. So I believe this is Strike Pass. Just have to play the damage cards we draw and block once. Oh no. Don't draw the strike. Okay. I can keep the speed potion even. 18. We can do whatever we want at this point, right? Just barely made it. I 
So to beat that fight, <laughs> um, the main thing about beating Hexaghost is working out how you're going to deal enough damage to kill Hexaghost before it kills you. And there's a usually a pretty set time when Hexaghost kills you. The second overcharge or the turn after or the turn after that is usually when you're going to die. So it's mostly just a matter of working out how you're going to deal that much damage in that little time. And I don't know a way to get good at that other than just doing it a lot. I'm sure that upgraded static would have dealt more damage there, but it's not going to be better for like all of the other fights in Act 2, probably. So we get some gold from the Hexaghost fight. And we're picking between Creative AI, Echo Form, and All for One. All for One can be a very powerful defect card. It's good with Sneko Eye, actually, because um, a quarter of your cards in your discard pile are going to cost zero on average, and then they come back to your hand when you play All for One, which is super, super, super strong. It's okay in this deck right now with a Go for the Eyes and FTL and plus one strength on all of our attacks. It's a pretty good attack at the moment. Um, Creative AI is a card that scales your deck very slowly, so if you don't get good scaling over the course of a run, if you don't actually just get scaling cards that get you to a point where you beat the heart on their own, Creative AI is like your backup plan, basically. It's a card that you can add one of to your deck, and you can have scaling for whatever fight you end up relying on it for, or fights if you end up doing that plural. For example, if you're playing a deck that goes for some sort of infinite combo with Compile Drivers and Fusion, but you see that you have to fight Time Eater, putting one Creative AI in your deck can just be enough to win that fight. It can give you an entirely separate game plan from the one that you had, where you're scaling with powers instead, and all of a sudden the fact that Time Eater um, hurts you for playing lots of cards a turn doesn't matter, because you're just playing a power or two every turn, and some block cards maybe. Creative AI similarly does that for Act 2 bosses sometimes, like it will beat Champ by itself if you don't have scaling to beat Champ with. But Creative AI I think is typically a backup plan or a secondary plan. It's something that goes in your deck to help you beat a fight that you can't beat with your primary plan, but I don't remember any, many runs where I won with Creative AI as my primary plan, basically. It's something that works in some fights, but is very, very, very poor in other fights. And so it's like a, a single card that can be in your deck for the fights where it's good, but otherwise you're not very excited about it. Echo Form is one of the strongest defect cards. I think maybe two-thirds of my defect wins have an Echo Form in them or something like that. Uh, we have Genetic Algorithm and Calipers, so there's just no world where we can possibly not take Echo Form, I don't think. When you play an Echo Form Genetic Algorithm, it levels up twice. Also, when we have calipers already, if this gets to 60 and then we play it twice, I believe we're just invincible until next week, I think is how the rules work. Um, I don't think you can take damage anymore. All right, cool. So, looking at our deck, we actually ended up with a decent Snekoi deck. Adding Echo Form and Glacier to the deck made Snekoi a really good pickup all of a sudden. I think we can probably still take Choker. Not very excited about Ectoplasm. In terms of necessity of a fourth energy, I wouldn't say that this deck has to have a fourth energy. It certainly wants one. The double compile driver and Echo Form make it a little bit better to have the fourth energy, but I'd certainly be taking a Runic Pyramid over an energy relic. Um, Static Discharge means that we are capable of winning fights without spending much energy on damage just by using health to get through the fights. So assuming that we got an okay Act 2 path, we should be able to win Act 2 okay on 3 energy. I would take Astrolabe over the worst energy relics, I think. Not sure about Pandora's box. I'm not sure how good our block really is. And we sort of need the defense, and we have a speed potion. Yeah, all of the boss relics seem like relatively reasonable for these cards. There's no 
there's no boss relic that is sometimes good that seems terrible right now because of the cards that we have, basically. Okay. Okay, I got you, game. I understand. Uh, these are not the most powerful boss relics in the game. These are not the most powerful boss relics in the game. So Calling Bell is worse than skipping. This deck doesn't have enough card draw to be okay with putting three curses into it. Also, this is a deck that has very powerful like card synergies and stuff already, so making our cards terrible in order to look for relic synergies just doesn't really make any sense. There's no reason whatsoever to think that might make the deck better. When Calling Bell is good is when you have a deck that has very poor synergy, like it doesn't have any connections between cards that really make it able to win Act 2, and you have a decent amount of card draw already, or some way to get rid of the curses, like you have a bunch of gold and a smiling mask or something like that. Calling Bell actually can be okay in that spot. It can be sort of a... Sort of leaning into variants, looking for something to rescue a run that's going pretty poorly, but has a couple of um, characteristics which make Calling Bell a little bit less bad than usual. That would be typically why I was taking Calling Bell, but that's not going on here. Tiny House is definitely better than skipping. We get a potion, 50 gold, 5 max HP, a card choice, and upgrade one random card. That is definitely better than skipping. I think. Probably because of Static Discharge, and the fact that Static Discharge can just win fights on its own as long as we're resting a lot. Um, we can just take Black Star and get some extra relics from an Elite Fight or two in Act 2. We'll have to use Potions, we'll have to use Rest Sites, but there's a decent chance that we survive this act. Okay... So Act 2 has El Campeon, the champ. The champ is a fight that is sort of designed to be made unfair, both in terms of it tries to be unfair to you, and the main way that you win it is by being unfair back. It's a fight where creative AI is really good. Champ does very little to you before he's below half health, so the idea is that you make your deck really strong before you make champ go below half health and then just kill him. Dark Orb could be really good. A creative AI could be really good. Just taking the Echo form and adding some other scaling could be enough as well. Hey, thanks so much for the raid, filthy robot. We're over explaining some Slay the Spy right now, so I'm not looking at chat a ton. Mostly just talking nonstop about Slay the Spire. But if you don't know Filthy and are looking for an excellent strategy gamer with a touch of salt, highly recommend checking out his channel. So if we get to champ with a reasonable path, there's a there's a very reasonable possibility that we are able to kill Champ at the end of this act. Because we're already, like, having an Echo Form means that any card that scales us is all of a sudden doing a lot more than it would otherwise. The trick is going to be getting to Champ on a path that isn't just so bad that we, you know, don't even get our deck stronger at all. Because our deck does have to get a little bit stronger. Probably the most exciting card in the entire game right now would be Self-Repair, because with Self-Repair, all of a sudden we can play our Echo Form, take a bunch of damage in a hallway fight, but Echo Form the Self-Repair, get our health back, double play our Genetic Algorithm. If we did that in like five hallway fights, all of a sudden our Genetic Algorithm is now blocking for 50 or 60 when we Echo Form it. And we're starting to have a deck, but we're a little way away from that right now. And did the game on a crash after beating the biggest fight? Ah, yes, games which crash to desktop. Rest in peace. That sucks. Typically speaking, in Act 2, it's very hard to have a deck that's good at all of the fights in Act 2, because they're just too hard. 
they're just difficult fights and you just don't have long enough to get your deck good enough at everything on Ascension 20. So typically what happens in Act 2 is that you build decks specifically to be good for the elite fights. My deck is specifically built for the elite fights already. Um, my priority on Static Discharge was very much about elite fights because of the Book of Stabbing. And honestly, basically just Static Discharge by itself makes this deck very good at elite fights, but not so great at hallway fights. The general mode of giving up health to win a fight using Static Discharge is great if you get two relics and increased chance of rare cards as a fight reward, but it's terrible if you're just fighting a mediocre hallway fight and then you get offered three attack commons as your reward. So with Static Discharge, what we really want to do is we want to like go to campfires and rest and then go to elite fights and put Static Discharge in play. And that's basically what we're trying to do. With how this has turned out, I think that the Static Discharge upgrade would actually have been better than plus strength probably, but I don't think that things turn out like this all that often. Like missing the energy and, and everything. We're just very heavily dependent on putting Static Discharge in play right now. So because you usually cannot fight hallway fights all that great in Act 2, usually, this is not always the case. If we had a self-repair in 4 energy right now, I would actually really love hallway fights because they'd be letting me double cast genetic algorithm and self-repair would probably be keeping me afloat, no problem. But because usually hallway fights are not great, usually you're going for events in Act 2. And Act 2 has some pretty good events. Apparitions are very good. Bites can be very good. And I would take bites in this situation. If you have a way to make bites better than they are to begin with, they start to be ridiculously good. And this deck has genetic algorithm. So giving up some max HP for bites doesn't matter as much because of the genetic algorithm calipers thing that's happening later on in the game. And it also has plus strength. And it also has Tongs, and it also has Echo Form. So this deck has tons of ways to take advantage of Bites. If your deck can only like draw Bites and play them as unupgraded Bites with no Strength gain or whatever, then Bites are not so exciting. But this is a deck that would love the Bites event. So Apparitions are great, Bites are great, upgrading all of our Strikes and Defends would be great. And probably the biggest thing about events is that they're not Hallway Fights, so that's great too. So I'm looking at this path. Once we get to the store, we'll have to make a decision about what we're doing for the rest of the act. Going campfire, store campfire, or maybe campfire, fight campfire. Probably going to a dead floor. Like, even if I had no gold, I'd probably rather go to the store than the fight here, just based on how the deck looks. And then probably we take one elite fight and rest, then take more events and rest again, and then try to fight champ somehow. That looks like a path where we can survive, despite having completely whiffed on our boss relic. And maybe we can get strong enough for the champ fight too. Maybe. Let's fight some thieves. Thieves are not a great first enemy to be fighting in this act. I think I'm just going to try to kill the front one since that is where damage has gone so far. Not really expect to get anything else out of it. The front thief um, blocks for less and his third attack is less as well. So it's a little bit easier to kill the front thief than the back thief usually. Also usually has lower health at the start of the fight. And that looks like it's fine. We got pretty lucky that the back thief decided to just attack twice and then leave us alone. Alright. Steam Barrier Claw Rebound. So Steam Barrier is one of those block cards. This deck doesn't have focus for Frost Orbs yet, but it does have a lot of Frost Orbs. So trying to work out how many block commons we want is a little bit tough. We don't want tons of them, but we probably don't want zero of them either because we don't have focus for the Frost Orbs yet. And with uh, zero energy in our relics, having a zero energy block card is pretty nice, especially with the two compile drivers, meaning that we're drawing extra cards and the cool-headed. 
Plus, if we ever draw Steam Barrier with Echo Form, that's going to be really nice. Let's us actually play Echo Form without dying, potentially. So Steam Barrier is definitely a high priority here. Claw is not terrible here. Claw would be too slow by itself to beat Champ, probably, but it's like one card to ward a strategy for scaling to beat Champ. And Rebound seems terrible. There's no card in our deck that's so strong that we want to play it two turns in a row and Rebound's just like a, a Strike Plus, and we're done playing Strike Pluses, I think. We don't want to put more Strike Pluses in the deck anymore, ever if possible. So it's between Steam Barrier and Claw. I think I'll just take the Steam Barrier. And we'll hope that we find some sort of scaling for champ later on somehow. Man. I was going to go to two stores, and I'm going to go to them with zero gold. That's unfortunate. I do think that it's correct to be spending 85 gold on a relic here, though, for sure. I'd rather lose my 85 gold than take a curse. Currently, card removes cost 100 gold, so... Most likely, I'd just go into this shop and remove the curse for 100 gold. And I'd have to take these two floors with the curse in my deck. These two floors can have fights in them. We got ourselves a singing bowl. So if we are looking at a card reward screen, now all of a sudden we have the option of taking two max HP instead of one of the cards. So we're going to end up doing that a decent amount, probably. We'll see. Good face, bad face. Fifty gold buys us a potion at a store. A potion's gonna be worth more than seven HP, so I'm definitely happy to lose seven HP for fifty gold right now. The question is, would it maybe be even better to trade faces? Trade Faces gives us a 20% chance of being weak on turn one, but we have Ginger, so we actually can't be weakened. So that face doesn't actually have a downside for us. 20% chance of losing the Relic in the next chest, that would suck. 40% um, chance of good faces, we got the face that gives us max HP, that would be handy. The face that gives us 50 gold per event room would actually be insane. So I'm going to a lot of event rooms this act. That'd be 200 gold in just this act. I think the strength of that face alone is probably enough to make this a trade. And then 20% chance of bird mask, which is whatever. Okay, so we got face of cleric. So plus one max HP at the end of combats. Singing bowl gives us plus two max HP at the end of some combats too. So we get some max HP. Doesn't do a ton right now, but it's a thing, I guess. My calipers, no. Now can I calipers? 13, 21, no. This looks like a miserable, miserable fight. I'm probably going to play Glacier, but not Cool-Headed this turn. Let's play Compile Driver first, then. FTL. And does Dual Cast Strike kill? 16, 23, 26. Not quite. We'll just play Glacier then and take a bit of damage. Oof. Not much reason to put Echo Form in play. Already played Genetic Algorithm, don't have a self-repair. This should just be lethal damage. Alright, didn't die. These plus max HP things give you plus current HP too, and it's a really big deal. And it's sort of weird that the game doesn't like tell you that that happens. Like it doesn't say anywhere that your current HP goes up by one either, right? I don't know. Heatsink's charge battery overclock. 
Charge Battery seems sweet. Charge Battery is a good card with Echo Form, because um, it's doing more than just blocking. It's also giving you energy next turn. It's a good card when you're stuck on three energy. It's a good card with Echo Form because it gives you four energy on the turn, which means that maybe you can get an Echo Form into play if you draw it on the four energy turn. It's an okay block common. It's a good card with Speed Potion. It's an okay card in the deck where we're trying to just Static Discharge and block for the right amount to channel two Lightning Orbs when we get hit. Lots of reasons why it's okay here. Overclock is a card that is usually not great. The place where it is great is if you have a deck that's trying to set something very, very strong up, and then it doesn't matter what's happening anymore because you've set up something very, very strong. That's actually the sort of defect deck that wins a lot of runs. So Overclock can be a really good card in a lot of winning defect decks. The thing is, if you don't have the really strong thing that you're setting up in place yet, Overclock is just not very good. So Overclock's one of those cards where most of the time when you're suffering through an Ascension 20 defect run, Overclock just doesn't do what you want it to do at all. But occasionally you'll have that run where things are going really well and an Overclock helps you out to make things go even better than that. Sort of takes a deck which is probably going to win and moves it more and more toward a deck that's almost certainly going to win. And so it's valuable to recognize that sometimes a card can do that. Heat Sinks is one of those cards that gets multiplicatively stronger with powers, but we're playing a deck that just doesn't have that many powers. So that's not what we want. So it becomes Charge Battery or plus two max HP. It's a question about which of those is better. Plus two max HP helps our resting, which is nice in this act. We're probably doing a lot of resting. Charge Battery helps our ability to... It just sort of smooths the entire experience of playing the deck out in a really nice way. Charge Battery is something that you're going to want to hologram a decent amount of the time, even if you have much better block cards. Like, even if there's a Glacier in your discard pile, there are often going to be turns where you want to hologram Charge Battery so that you have energy on the next turn as well. This effect, where next turn you gain one energy, is quite nice when it's attached to a card which is already giving you, you know, average output. So I think I've talked myself into a charge battery. We're going to probably skip the store, unless there's something on ridiculous amounts of sale. It's worth it to look at the store and see what isn't available to you for the rest of the run. So Mercury Glass, Vajra, and Hand Drill not being available isn't that relevant, but Sometimes if a relic that you might have played toward becomes unavailable, you'll know not to bother playing toward it anymore. Um, if I didn't have calipers yet, for example, I might be thinking, oh, the only... One of the only ways that I could possibly win would be to echo form genetic algorithm and then find a calipers later. And then seeing calipers in the store would um, reduce the number of relics that are left in the game, and the reduced pool of relics wouldn't have calipers in them anymore, and I'd know, okay, like, playing that strategy is pretty dumb because I can't ever get calipers. So getting this information is valuable and useful, and in this case it doesn't really, doesn't really affect anything because the relics that we're seeing just don't do very much. The remaining relics for the rest of the run are slightly less likely to be so-so damage relics though, so I guess we know that. Definitely not taking an elite fight right now. I think what I like doing is... I think I like lifting once, going through the store, resting, and then taking this elite fight. I think with the two strength from lifting, the other option is like rest to go through the hallway fight. It's about lift to go through the hallway fight. The hallway fight gives us potions sometimes. It gives us genetic algorithm upgrades. It gives us card choices, which are sometimes helping us kill champ. I talked myself into it. Let's take the hallway fight. Let's lift against the hallway fight then. Very 
15. We actually get calipers here for four block. So definitely a moment for static discharge. That means that I want to block for exactly 15. I guess I'll block for not quite 15. And this turn I'm just taking a billion damage. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great work, Act 2. Um, I don't believe I want to play Zap because I want this to passively block for two and evoke for five. I wanted to do both, which means I wanted to evoke on my enemy's turn. So charge battery strike strike should be fine. Focus potion. And a core surge. Core surge with the speed potion that we have already is one way definitely that we could beat the champ. So core surge gives us an artifact charge which stops a debuff being applied to us and the lose five dexterity at the end of your turn is a debuff. So we can use core surge to get five dexterity for the entirety of the champ fight. I think that that alone makes this a pretty easy core surge. Holograms, okay. Um, there are maybe like two things that it does that are cool in this deck. Getting charge battery back, getting go for the eyes back. Maybe getting steam barrier back is okay. For the most part, like getting glacier back is just, that's three energy and we don't have that much energy. So probably that play doesn't happen all that often. Leap is another block common, and at some point we're going to have to stop taking block commons, I think. So I think just taking Core Surge for the value against champ seems great. And definitely have to rest so that we have some health for the elite fight coming up. Runic Dodecahedron. So Runic Dodecahedron's okay. If we get the Bites event and probably atrocious in every other run that we play. <laughs> the The way that Runic Dodecahedron would be good it would be if we got Bites event. We have three events left in Act 2. It's like a 15% chance or something probably to get Bites. I don't know that for sure. I just sort of made it up. It might be higher than that. I already saw Face Trader... I haven't seen Arena or Apparitions or Upgrade Strikes Defense. It's just so good if we get Bites that I think I'm meant to take it. It's plausible we could get bird face turn from the elite fight and then get some powers and have runic dodecahedron going off a lot. It's plausible we could get pantograph and have it going off in boss fights a decent amount. It's plausible we could bottle a genetic algorithm with like 60 block on it and have it going off for the majority of act 3 and 4. And the thing about Sapphire Key is that you know exactly what Sapphire Key does in Act 2, which is nothing. So I think given that we're likely to die right now and there are worlds where Runic Dodecahedron gets really good here, we should probably just take Runic Dodecahedron. We have the Nest! We grab a Ritual Dagger, costs us 6 HP, the Ritual Dagger starts at 15. I am playing a deck where I have Echo Form. So if I get an attack that deals like 40 damage, I get to Echo Form it in Act 4, potentially. I'm also playing a deck which has a genetic algorithm and some Frost Orbs and an Echo Form, so the deck is trying to delay fights. It can't right now. It might get to a point where it can in Act 3, 
and if if it gets to the point where it can delay fights, killing enemies with Ritual Dagger is going to be pretty easy for the easier hallway fights. So it should be fairly reasonable to stack it. I think I'm going to take it. I deal 17 damage for 1 energy. That's a good card for the elite fights. Right. Gremlin Leader. Hey. Turn 1 Echo Form is really good here, I think. So Gremlin Leader is my favorite fight in the game. Gremlin Leader's AI is very um, very manipulable. It is possible to manipulate Gremlin Leader's AI. Gremlin Leader will only buff minions or attack when he has two or more minions summoned, and he won't do either of those things twice in a row. So if I don't kill a minion this turn, I know it is guaranteed that I will get attacked for 11 times 3 by Gremlin Leader next turn. Which is quite a lot, especially when I'm at 37. If I do kill a minion, Gremlin Leader, when he has 0 or 1 minions in play, will buff, attack, or summon with um, some proportional percentages. And so if I'm worried about dying next turn, what I have to do is go FTL strike and kill one of the Gremlins. If I'm worried about dying in general in the fight though, which I think I'd better be, what I want to do is play the Echo form. I'm going to focus pot for this as well. So using the speed potions, very unappealing. Like it would do a lot this turn. I'm going to get 20 block out of it if I use it this turn, but I don't get to use it against the champ if I do it now. The question is, do I want to double stack genetic algorithm and get four more block, or do I want to have an extra two energy next turn with a bunch of compile drivers getting drawn? Twenty, thirty-one, forty 40 against 43 incoming. I'm going to go ahead and take the full block. Okay, now Gremlin Leader is buffing again. This is getting terrifying. With Echo Form in play, Ritual Dagger would play twice to kill Mad Gremlin. I wonder if it stacks. I don't actually know. Oh, it does. I didn't know that. I would not have actually expected that even. Okay, no frost orbs. So getting attacked for 16 times 3 here would be bad. It is happening. We dead? <laughs> 32, 48, 32, 48. We can survive with six health. I'm not gonna be using the speed potion. I'm just gonna be surviving on six health. We need the speed potion for champ. You're just gonna buff yourself twice and then kill me, huh? That's what you're gonna do? Alright. This turn looks pretty bad. I don't have any card draw, so we have to work out some sort of solution from the cards in front of us. I have a potential kill, right? Probably not. So, double Glacier Zap dual cast, and we have to kill the Sneaky Gremlin with Lightning Orbs. How much does that block for? This is 11, 22, 25, 
Then we get hit for too much and die. Alright, so I have to use this as well. It's too bad. Forty, forty-two, forty-six. It means I'm still alive, but I no longer have plus five decks for the champ fight. I wanted charge battery in my deck before I reshuffle that upgrade, oh, I've just drawn it again. Awesome. All right. Hopefully we had something good from that. Shuriken and a happy flower. I can probably play three attacks in a turn sometimes, and the happy flower is great. Um, happy Flower alleviates some of our energy issues. Not bad at all. Reinforced bodies, pretty solid with Echo Form and with Calipers. I can just take my three energy for the turn and make 42 block and then have Calipers active. Actually, I have Warped Tongs as well, so it can upgrade sometimes for me, which gets even better. Reinforced Body is a block card that... It's a block card that's strong enough that if you're trying to block without Frost Orbs being great, it actually can be a pretty big deal. Right now I could imagine this deck beating Act 4 by blocking with cards like Reinforced Body and Genetic Algorithm and just channeling a bunch of Lightning with Static Discharge. Although it's hard to channel Lightning with Static Discharge when you have 200 block and Calipers. You just... <laughs> You don't receive much attack damage in that situation. I think taking Reinforced Body makes a lot of sense, though. Alright, let's do it. Storm is one of those cards that gets good with other powers, but we don't have them. Scrape is just a generally pretty terrible card. Generally speaking, you don't want to put your Echo Form into your discard pile. You want to put it into play. And generally speaking, you're not that excited about drawing your go for the eyes. Like, like great, congratulations. But even in like a deck that's centered around playing a bunch of claws, playing scrape and discarding your all for one is just not a very good thing to be doing. Alright, I'll take the reinforced body. I will rest. Okay, so we are definitely taking Apparitions here. Absolutely no question there. We're not paying any current HP, which makes it a lot more appealing. Apparitions help us get our Caliper stuff online, help us get Echo Form into play, all of that. Apparitions are very, very strong on Defect with Echo Form, and that's exactly the world that we're in. We also have a bunch of ways to get max HP back, so we're losing 50% of our max HP, but we'll probably end the run with significantly more than 50 max HP anyway. Which means that we're not in that much danger of just getting one shot. Apparitions are, I would say, usually taken on Defect. It's sort of unusual for Defect not to want these, and this is certainly a situation where we do want them. I wonder with Apparitions if we now want to take the Hallway Fight. The Hallway Fight lets us stack Genetic Algorithm, lets us get up to plus 3 max HP. The fact that the question mark no longer gives us Apparitions is a pretty big deal, although Bites are so good now, now that we're giving up significantly less max HP for them, and we still have 4 Strikes in our deck, and we have the Runic Dodecahedron and the Shuriken. Bites are so good. Fights are very good. Upgrade strikes defends are quite good too. 
store doesn't really do anything. If we fight the arena event, I probably don't get to fight for the relics. I think that bites and upgrade strikes defends are so good that we take the event though. Okay, some sort of relic. A regal pillow. I don't have any sustain right now at all. My sustain is like gaining max HP and getting current max HP out of it. But if I rest at campfires, I get what, 10 HP or something? So Regal Pillow turns on Runic Dotecahedron for us when we rest. It probably gets us an extra 30 or 40 HP over the course of a run. Sure. I guess we take Regal Pillow. We're starting to get to the point where there isn't that much longer left in the run, and so taking mediocre relics is starting to hurt a little bit. In order to actually win this champ fight, we sort of have to just survive and put Echo Form in play, and then we stack shurikens and hope that we win, <laughs> is basically the strategy. Upgrading an Apparition is not terrible, but I don't have an Equilibrium or anything, or a Hologram, so drawing it on the right turn is going to be difficult to do. Lifting is not terrible. Resting for the plus one energy at the start of the fight is definitely not terrible. Resting is the thing that we do if we think the champ fight's particularly difficult. Lifting is the thing that we do for general st strength in the deck, I think. Smithing seems weird. I think I'll just lift. Gotta actually kill champ somehow, right? Okay, the turn one buff from champ is not very good. I cannot play cool headed right now. It would just be very, very bad to draw Echo Form and not be able to put it in play. I think I probably spent long enough not putting Echo Form in play that I lose. Jeez. much that could have been done about that. I could have played the two defensive cards for two block with calipers there. Jeez. That's unfortunate. So I don't think I can ever win unless Echo Form goes in play, which means I have to go Echo Form Steam Barrier here. I don't think that going like Apparition Charge Battery is ever winning the fight. Play a couple of these. Just make sure that Shuriken keeps stacking. Okay. 
Ooh, buffing strength now. Champ, 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 champ. Please stop. Our damage is shuriken, right? Static discharge doesn't deal damage anymore because we have two health. So our damage is shuriken. Let's try to keep that going. I think I like cool headed looking for go for the eyes. I think I like that slightly more than charge battery or glacier. If I put champ below half health here. I am not going to be debuffed at all when the execute happens. So let's do that. It's not the greatest split in the world in terms of health. We're not significantly below 220, but in terms of how many debuffs we have, it's well worth it. This is 42 block. This is 20 plus 14 this is 34 block, but would have more energy next turn. I think there's enough card draw on the deck to want the energy next turn. Probably want double compile driver. If I don't play cool headed this turn, I can double genetic algorithm next turn. Does that do anything? I don't think that does very much. now. Probably won't draw it again at a relevant point in this fight. Okay, unfortunately we're getting debuffed. That is a catastrophe. Champ doesn't always debuff you in this phase of the fight, but when you do get debuffed before you get executed, man it is worse than when you don't. Maybe it'll be okay. We'll see. I have six energy next turn at least. I'm not going to play Compile Driver because if I draw a Reinforced Body, uh, it's not good. Mm, this still didn't upgrade. So if I play this, it is 60 block. It's a lot of block. We're out of calipers at this point. And that's 51. Well, it's unfortunate, but we didn't quite make it. Perhaps with an earlier echo form, that fight could have gone better. Definitely with the speed potion still, I think we would have been fine. it was a good attempt.